Hey, how's it going, everybody? I'm Ben from Universal Audio, and welcome back. It's Monday. That means it's time for Office Hours. Uh, we've got a really great show uh, prepped for you guys today. We're going to be talking all about cues, both in Luna and console. Uh, so if any of you guys are uh, at home tracking with headphones, working with musicians, working with Hearback or Avium systems, uh, we're going to kind of go through everything that we can think about when it comes to cues. And of course, if you guys have got questions, hit us up in the chat, let us know uh, as we're as we're moving along. We're going to cover a lot of ground in today's show. We're going to dedicate 100% to talking about the cues. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to make sure everybody is aware. Uh, if you, hopefully you guys were all checking out the cool countdown because we feature so much amazing music in those countdowns. Uh, but we need you guys' help to keep on filling those countdowns with awesome music. So uh, hit us up live at uaudio.com. Uh, if you're making music inside of Luna or with Apollos or with UAD, we want to hear it. We want to know about it. We want to be able to feature you guys here in these countdowns. Uh, so hit us up on email uh, to get featured at, on those. And of course, those amazing studio photos, uh, those are all pulled from Instagram. Use the hashtag Universal Audio uh, to make sure that we see those as well. Um, don't forget right now, there's the Hot 50 sale. We can get 50% off on UAD and some Luna plugins. And most importantly, uh, today we're going to talk all about cues, but we've actually got a show coming up tomorrow. Uh, we've got Fab and Lewis and Will coming back, and we're going to be uh, releasing the Everyman Luna session. So uh, for everyone that's been following along last year with the Tales from the Switch series, uh, you guys saw how the song was made 100% remotely, 100% inside of Luna, uh, it mixed strings, everything. It was a really cool series seeing the song come together. Uh, and finally, tomorrow is the day where that session will now be available inside the app, available for you guys to download. And we're going to bring back uh, Fab and Lewis and I think Will as well to, uh, to talk about the session, answer your guys' questions, show off some of the cooler things inside the session as well. Uh, so don't miss out on that. That'll be tomorrow at 11. You know, so same time, same place. Just come back here tomorrow for that. Uh, and with that, let me bring on Drew and Matt to help me uh, talk to you guys about cues. How's it going, guys? Good, dude. How, How you doing, doing ben? ben? Oh wow, you guys are so in sync. So are you guys, you guys are using Q monitor, I guess. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah, you know, low latency. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Well, uh, man, that's uh, you know, just talk about cues at a high level, real quick. Like, why are cues important? How do engineers use it? And you know, what 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 dif what's the difference between a monitor and a cue? I guess is probably the most essential part of this question, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess I guess I can go first, but and you know, for me as a as a you know, I'm more more from the engineering side. You know, it's always been that the control room needed its own mix, and mm -hmm. the, you know, the monitor mix and the monitor path is where is what that's all about. So, um, so in my world, I always want to be free to do whatever I want in the control room, and uh, and of course, at the same time, I want to be able to create these separate discrete mixes so that the artists get exactly what they want. Um, you know, most singers need to hear themselves a good bit louder than I probably want to listen to them. Um, uh -huh. You know, and you know, of course, the drummers course, want the, the click track. They, they <laughs> yeah, want the click track just ripping the their one. ears off. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. The drummers need that click. You know, it like plus eight. You know, on on the Q send. Mm -hmm. um, so in my world, it's super. I've always operated under this. You know, monitor mix is all about me making making it sound good in the control room and let me hear things in context and then making as many cues you know uh, as needed for the artist. So. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really important distinction. You know, nowadays we're going to cover all sorts of things today, but like for in my world, that's it's all almost always it's a distinct and discrete uh, set of mixes for me and for them. Yeah, and that's really that's this is the this is where it can get very confusing very fast for a lot of folks. So we're going to do our best today to simplify this uh, and really talk about when and where you'd use the different scenarios and the different features because in Apollo's, especially when they expanded Apollo system, it there there's so many. Q options. There's ways to route cues, ways to build uh, headphone mixes for your for your uh, musicians. Uh, it can actually get kind of overwhelming. So we're we'll, we're going to break it down. We're going to go from simple to complex. Uh, this won't be a short show. There's a lot of ground <laughs> to cover here. Uh, so if you're if you're looking for the complex stuff, just hang in there. We'll get to talking about uh, hearbacks and avioms and uh, all all sorts of really advanced topics as well as using. Uh, console using Pro Tools, using other DAWs, and how monitoring through those works. Uh, but we do want to start simple. We want to, you know, kind of 
take kind of the scenarios that we see a lot of people uh, jumping into, where whether you're working by yourself, working with other with a vocalist or a musician, and and then you know ultimately getting to a complex uh, thing with like a band sort of scenario. Um, and yeah, Drew, you made such a good point of it. It is like it is just man. It's a different mix for when you, you know, this is and this is me personally. Like I leave my cues are typically just my monitors, right? Like that's that's the cue system. Even on, I'm on headphones in a small production environment. Most of the time, you can kind of just leave your headphone output set to mix. So whatever you hear coming out your speakers is also what you hear in your headphones. It's when you get to that point where you want to hear something different in your headphones than what you hear at your speakers. That's when you really start engaging the cue system. Um, yeah, for sure. Like you said, though, even, you know, even even in my world, there are times where if I'm tracking with a vocalist that, and I want to keep things super simple, and it for speed, you know, for speed, uh, there are plenty of times where I'll just send the mix to the artist in the booth, provided that they're okay with it and I'm okay with it. Then, you know, as you're stacking up tracks and you're adding tracks and you're adding reverb and you're doing things like that, it it just all sort of takes care of itself. But there are times where you just, you know, I, I had a vocalist in in the booth the other day who mm -hmm. was just needed himself exceedingly loud and i couldn't and sometimes it's it's inexplicable i'm just like man i do not but you know it is what it is they they, they need what they want they like what they want mm -hmm. like what they like so um, yeah but well, there are also, times where yeah and not just volume too right effects like being able to like sometimes yeah. singers want a ton of reverb they want way more reverb than what you want to listen to and again this is yeah. where having having a solid cue system really allows you to give them exactly what they need and want in their headphones while maintaining, you know, what you need to hear for clarity as the engineer, um, and as, again, this works whether you guys are in the same room or in, or in, you know, uh, you have a booth or you have a live room sort of scenario as well. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, this is this will be this will be really fun. So I guess let's kind of dive in. Let's start, like I said, let's start simple. So let's start <laughs> like let's assume you have say like a twin or an Apollo solo. So something with uh, you know something with just one headphone out on the front, a monitor out on the back. Um, so this is where, you know, Matt, you know, I think you're kind of in the same boat as I am, right? Where you basically, you're living in mix mode most of the time, right? And then, yeah. uh, and then occasionally breaking out to Q. Um, do you want to, here, let me share your screen here and, and let's start walking people through where these options live inside of Luna uh, and how to, how to start addressing them. Yeah, and Ben, sure. if just I, just if people want to get a feel for this, I think isn't that how you did the Greaves session, that Greaves video on YouTube? Mm -hmm. Didn't you guys just share the mix out? So if anybody's interested in you know an expanded insight into this workflow, then definitely check out Ben's uh, video with Greaves um, tracking vocals because that's what they did, and yep. it's a, it's a great video. Uh, lots of great tips in that video. Yeah, and as, and as much as I say, you know, we're going to talk about wanting separate mixes. A lot of the times, I'm I'm kind of in the boat of like, if I am attracting a vocalist, I kind of want to hear what they're hearing so that I can make those judgments. Because knowing me, I'll forget that they're on a separate mix and then totally mess it up and and uh, <laughs> and start feeding them things that they don't need to hear or blowing their head off with too much stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, so the. I guess a lot of this action is happening over on the right hand lower side of Lu both Luna mm -hmm. and console. And, and like I said, we'll, we'll show a lot of this in Luna. Most of the lessons we're going to teach you guys about today also apply to console. And we'll talk further about that a little bit later on in the show. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of these concepts really apply to live streaming and podcasting and that kind of stuff as well. I mean, we use the Q system for our live stream setup to control, you know, what gets sent out to the stream and what we hear in our headphones. So that's part yep. of what we'll cover today too. Super true. Cool. So yeah, um, like Ben said, everything starts over here in the bottom right hand side. You have either console or Luna. Um, we're gonna be talking about it in the context of Luna first, but uh, the the console monitor section mirrors what you see in Luna here. Um, so I'm on an Apollo Solo. It's about the as basic as you can get for a Q system because it just has two output paths, which is the monitor outputs and then the headphone output on the front. Mm -hmm. um, so by default, you know the uh, I guess let's start at the the top. Um, the monitor outputs by default are listening to the monitor source, which is anything that you send to the main outputs in Luna. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, like this track's being sent to main. So, any or my uh, control room, I have the monitor source selected. So, whatever's being sent to main is coming out of the monitor left and right outputs in my Apollo Solo. Uh, over here on the Q outputs panel, this is where you can uh, either route the same mix that you're hearing out of your monitor left and right outputs to the headphone outputs as well, or you can set up a custom mix. Um, so most people are going to want to use it with this mix button lit up on the HP row. Um, and you can see here it says uh, monitor mix to HP. So that's basically saying that whatever's being sent to the monitor outputs is also being sent to the headphone outputs. 
Um, so like Ben was saying for the grieve session, this is the the case where you'd, you'd want to hear the same thing in the control room as what the artist is hearing in their headphones. Um, this will mirror that mix of the headphones. Well, and the really, really important step when you're doing this, uh, so say you have your, your solo hooked up to speakers, right? Uh, you, you, you and the artist put on headphones. Don't forget to turn off your monitors. Otherwise, you're going to have sound coming out <laughs> through the speakers, back in through the mic. Uh, so is there a quick way Is there a quick way to cut uh, on, on Apollos or uh, to quickly turn off the speakers? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, this little mute button over in the bottom right corner, um, mm -hmm. that'll just mute your monitor outputs, but it, the monitor path is still open, so whatever's being sent to those outputs will still make it to the HP outputs on the Apollo Solo since this mix button is lit up. Oh, nice. Uh, awesome. Yeah, so and, completely independent. Nice. And so then when you uncheck the mix button, now your monitors just get the main output, but now inside of your session you can send things to HP in, in the Q row, correct? Yeah, exactly. So once I unselect mix, uh, you can see it says HP to HP there. Um, so in the context of Luna, anything that I send to the HP queue on any of track um, will get sent directly to the, the headphone outputs. So basically the, the main faders in Luna are sending the, the mix for the monitor mix, mm -hmm. and then these queue knobs are setting the mix for the headphone outputs. You can actually have different mixes for each output. Uh, which is really cool if you want to give the, the artist a little bit more uh, click track in their, their headphones, a little bit more of their vocal in their headphones um, than you would actually want to be hearing in the monitor speakers. Nice. Well, and there's a cool thing, too, in, inside of Luna that uh, we, we've shown this a few times, I think, last year, but uh, it's kind of it feels like a bit of a unique feature where on the main fader, the main fader has a cue send available to it. Um, right. so especially if you're in that scenario, right, where you're working with a vocalist where you want to send them, you don't want to go through and every single track of your mix have to turn up the send to the headphones, right? Otherwise you're kind of, right. again, you're rebuilding the mix all over again. Uh, what you can do a real quick shortcut is to go to your main fader, turn up the send to the headphones there. And then, uh, and then all your live tracks. So like your, your vocal track, for instance, then you, ha you know, you have your main level and then you have your vocal level. And those are the only two. Uh, headphone cue sends that you have to worry about uh, level wise. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I can come over here to the main track and um, option click on the knob that'll automatically set to zero. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm getting, you know, full level to the headphone outputs of whatever's being sent to the main. Then I can go over to the vocal track, whatever that may be, and uh, use that to add even more of the, the vocalist in their headphones nice. um, without affecting what I'm hearing through the, the main speakers as well. Yeah, and an alternative to that, you know, is the copy to cues or copy to headphones. If you, you know, in the mix window, if you right click on the fader cap, then you can actually copy your main monitor mix to the headphone mix and then customize from there. So it becomes like a, uh, uh, a way of building an initial mix and then tweaking it from there. So um, you can, there's lots of options. There. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and the yeah. and one of the other really important options you bring up there, right, Drew, is uh, notice notice on that Q send, there's a P and an M. Uh, so the M stands for mute. So that's when you want to quickly just mute what's going in there. But the P is really, really important to, to pay attention to because uh, that means pre-fader. Um, so, right. Matt, in this context, that means that you're, you get all the inserts. You get everything that's happening on the channel except for the fader at the bottom no longer controls how much audio is going to the headphones, correct? Yeah, exactly. So um, I can basically set this level independent of the fader. If I have it in post fader mode, then whatever the uh, main fader is set to, let me zoom out here, whatever the main fader is set to will actually affect the level that's being sent to this headphone output. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, yeah, it'll, usually... and you'll have contentious arguments between engineers as to which way is better. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm personally, I'm a post fader kind of guy cause you know, I want them to, to hang in with each other, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of good reasons why you won't, would want that to be set in one place, especially if you're, if you're in the control room fidgeting around with the levels, you don't necessarily want that fidgeting to go be passed through to the performer who's in the middle of a take. Uh, yeah. And if you're soloing things, it, you can't solo when you're in post. So, uh, cause you know, the d destructive solo mode or solo in place. Uh, will mute the feeds to those cues if they're posts. So be careful there. Nice. Yeah, and that's a good the, point. Well, there's a good question here in the chat from Bo. And uh, I see Fiddle Me already answered him, but I, I want to put this in the video so that everyone uh, sees it as well. So he's asking, you know, would you get the vocal through both the main and also the instrumental track in Luna? Uh, and the answer is no, you wouldn't. Uh, so what happens because of arm mode uh, to get, you know, for the low latency recording experience, you, you put your session into arm mode. Whenever you arm record arm or input a uh, monitor a track, it's going to bypass the main fader. So now you're just you're monitoring straight off that channel, 
uh, and still going to your monitor outputs, but it's bypassing that main fader. So now you do get independent control over it. Uh, and that's really where this workflow kind of comes to life. Yeah, and what you want to be sure is when you move on to the next track, go ahead and mute the cue on the track you were just on so you don't send double the amount. Because this is the moment you turn off the record enable, it will go to both the cue and the main and therefore get double in the hood in the headphones. So Yep, right. exactly. It's something something really cute. And yeah, we even put that in our notes here. Watch out when when you stop recording. If you have it <laughs> uh if you have it pre fader and you have it being sent on the vocal channel and the main, uh yeah, when you go to press playback, you're now gonna potentially get double the volume of, of the vocal and this is uh again this is one of the reasons why i personally when i'm working in a small just me and a vocalist sort of scenario i'll often leave it in mix so that way i don't accidentally end up in a scenario like that where they're getting twice as much vocal and they're like dude why is my vocal so loud did i clip like they'll they'll get a little bit paranoid sometimes that they clipped or they like over were way too loud uh, but it's just because they're now hearing themselves twice both from the, the individual track and from the main output uh, whereas if you if you're doing this sort of tracking scenario in mix, it's just you and you and the artist are both hearing the exact same thing, and you can adjust um, and and you know put up with listening to what they're listening to. But that is, it can be really helpful, and and uh, we're going to show this option a little bit later as well. But you'll notice on uh, in the bottom right hand side of Matt's screen where it says source. Like right now, he's on monitor, so it's whatever's going to his monitors is what he's listening to. You do have the ability as the engineer with all Apollos to listen to what's being sent to the headphones out through the monitor source, correct? Yeah, so then um, if you, you know, the, the Apollo Solo only has one headphone out, so assuming the artist is listening to the headphones, you need a way to kind of hear while you're setting up that headphone mix for him. Mm -hmm. um, so you can set the source to HP, then you're hearing whatever's getting sent to the HP outputs in your monitors, you can dial in the mix, and then uh, be sure that whatever they're hearing in the headphones is exactly the same thing that you heard in your monitors. And then when you're done, switch back to monitor, and you still have the two separate paths again. Nice. Nice, man. Well, and then I guess the, the other note uh, we made here to kind of talk about early on is is panning of cues, right? So, so far, we, you know, we showed you where the cue send is, how to do pre-fader or post-fader sends uh, to the cue. Uh, but the other important part is being able to, to pan, to be able to change the stereo field of those. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I want to show people how to do that. Totally, yeah. So you'll notice um, just in the normal view when you first open the mixer in Luna, um, there are, is no pan knob. There's just one knob that controls the level. But if you click this little icon over here, um, it'll expand the cues to fader view, and then you actually have pan knobs for each of them. Um, so like these stereo tracks, I can pan in stereo, uh, you know, left to right. <coughs> uh, and yeah, that's the case for any track. So yeah, if you want to basically maintain the, the same panning that you have in your headphones uh, when you're sending the HP outputs, you can do that with these controls here. Nice. Awesome. So that's kind of the, the, as far as I know, that's, that's sort of the basic, this is, you know, the, uh, Matt's on an Apollo solo. So this is about as easy and basic as it gets when it comes to headphone monitoring. Um, right. And then, you know, from here, uh, from here on up, we just keep on adding on more features and more uh, flexibility and more power, but with more power comes more responsibility. So the <laughs> uh, big thing we're gonna, that we're gonna, we'll kind of show here is that you, uh, you know, being able to now with a larger system, how this kind of build, how we build on these concepts. Um, but you know, again, just we're going to be focusing a lot on that on this cue row, and then at the bottom hand right, the control room and the cue outputs. These are kind of our most important zones uh, inside of Luna to really understand for uh, for controlling these sorts of scenarios. Yeah, and and one other thing I want to mention before we move on. Um, let's say you do have the headphone source set to mix. We've we've only been talking about it in the context of Luna, mm -hmm. um, being whatever you send to the main outputs in Luna gets sent to that mix. Um, but the if you have the source set to mix, it actually includes whatever else you're getting sent to the monitor left and right outputs as well from other applications. Oh yeah. Um, so for for example, if I come in here. Um, and set my Apollo to be the main output for all core audio, and I set the uh, the outputs to monitor left and monitor right, that gets included in that mix as well. So it's whatever gets sent to the main fader in, in Luna, as well as whatever's getting sent to monitor left and right from other applications like Spotify, iTunes, what have mm -hmm. you. Well, and this is, uh, Matt, you're just showing, you're showing a cool, interesting area. Uh, someone asked earlier about uh, using virtual channels for cues or being able to yeah. send system audio just to the cues. Cause, and there's a cool trick that we'll show you guys about this uh, here in a bit as well. But where Matt is at, so audio MIDI setup, and then configure speakers. It's it's labeled weirdly. You're like yeah. uh, configure speakers, but actually what this says is whenever you select Universal Audio Thunderbolt from your as your audio output, it gives you the flexibility of telling it which channels you want it to be sent to. And by default, it's going to go monitor left right because it assumes that that's where you want it to go. 
but you do have other options available uh, in those drop downs, including sending straight to the headphones, right? So like we exactly. Uh, this is that's kind of the trick that we're using here to monitor each other and our headphones, but not have it go to air. Is you know sending our system audio, sending our audio out of the computer just to the headphones, just to the cues. Yeah, and you can also send a virtual, and then you know choose where you send to um, each cue from there inside a console. But yeah, it's it's pretty flexible with all the the different output paths that we give you in the driver. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and again, on a bigger system, you'll notice that that everything about this just kind of continues to expand in the in your possibilities. Um, nice. Well, we're getting getting lots of good questions here in the chat. So let, let me bring uh, to make sure we're we're rounding up on these. Um, in console, is there a way to set the post fader mix to cue? Uh, in console specifically, Drew, do you know is that is it possible uh, to be yeah. in post or is it always pre fader? Oh, uh, gosh, it's been a while since I've been in console, but yeah, I mean, cues are, uh, yeah, I guess they are always pre. I think they're yeah, always they're, pre-fader. Yeah, they're always pre. yeah, in, yeah. In it's, been, it's been a while. Sorry, I had to check because uh, it's been a while <laughs> since I've been in console only. But yeah, you know, yeah, console, they're dedicated cues. You know, these these paths are in, they're, they're behind the scenes. They're not subject to buffers. They're in the DSP. And mm-hmm. so therefore they have a very specific function. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's their pre in console because, uh, you'd want them to be um mm-hmm. that's the, yeah that's the and function that, you know exactly the yeah. way to think about console is like that's your that's your input monitoring uh sort of domain right so uh, yeah. everything about that's kind of happening before it goes to pro tools or ableton or to another daw uh and this is you know frankly part of the reason why we made luna was to take this like two app process and having an input console application and a, and a daw happening simultaneously the real idea yeah. behind Luna is like, man, we could do all these extra features, including pre and post fader headphone sends, uh, by integrating a it all into Q one. On the, yeah, Q on the main, Q on the main can ha- you know, mm-hmm. is not easily done in that way unless you're in control of everything. Yeah, and yeah, and again, we'll as uh, alluded to a little bit earlier, we'll talk about this later on the show how to do all this stuff uh, with other DAWs and with uh, with console as well. But uh, the easiest way to teach it right now is uh, is through Luna. Um, Fiddle me this had a, a great point of feedback. I want to make sure everybody knows when uh, when you go normally, like you know, Matt showed us. We normally our speakers are normally on monitor, but you can of course switch them to headphones. Now, when you're using a twin or a rack mount Apollo that's got a talkback button on it, be very careful because you can get a lot of feedback uh, if you don't have your dim settings uh, sharp enough, or uh, just you know, if your monitors are too loud and too close to your talkback mic. So, good, great, great word of caution there. I can tell that was learned by experience. <laughs> uh, can you shift select copy faders to queue to quickly select faders to copy to the queue on a large session with group busing, et cetera, to keep from doubling up on individual tracked and some ones? Uh, that would be good. Selection grouping would be really good for that. Um, I believe, yeah, and I believe yeah. you can. Let me, uh, let me, let's test yeah. this together here, guys. Um, so let's, let me pull up, let me show my queue track here. So now if I select, say, all my guitars and then. Do uh, click on the faders, Q, copy to Q1. So it just did, it did my whole session on that one. Yeah, I believe I believe that right click thing is is do is basically due to all. It doesn't it doesn't uh, that's where selection grouping um, would be good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I had them selected with a selection group. So I think I think the only controls right now is to copy the whole mix up to the cues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For that, for the right click, yeah, for right, yeah. in that right click command, yeah. That's yeah. a good fee- good piece of feedback, you know, to yeah, have the- that right click menu yeah. subjected to selected tracks for sure. Hit that feedback button, Paul. We'd appreciate it. Um, <laughs> is there a keyboard shortcut to toggle between mix and second Q mix? I don't believe there's a keyboard shortcut to do that. I think that's a mouse only operation. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, Glenn, you guys, you guys are you guys. We're like just getting started on the show. You guys have already got some amazing feedback and uh, <laughs> and ideas here. Uh, Mags is asking no third party plugins option for the queue. Uh, correct. So, you know, part of the whole concept behind the queue mixes and, and headphone monitoring just in general, latency matters. It's the only thing that matters actually when it comes to headphone mixes, right? Like, uh, so everything that's going to happen inside of Luna and console is done with that in mind to, to deliver the lowest latency experience to your performers. Um, so that means native processing would mean another trip into the computer, around <laughs> through the plugins, back out through the buffer. It would just add too much latency uh, to to really uh, to live up to the experience that we all expect from a recording console. Um, so that's the reason why there's no third-party plugins available 
uh, for your cue mixing. At the, um, and let's see, making sure, dude, fill me this. He's all over, all over the questions w- way before I get a, get to him. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is great. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Okay, you guys are all you're catching up on this. Why is it just four cues? The limitation. Why not eight cues? Uh, yeah, Kareem. So this is uh, Drew. I think you, you've kind of run up on the on the maximum amount of cues. Do you know why is there only four of them? And is there a trick to be able to get eight? Well, yeah, we're gonna sh- and we're gonna show this later. The idea of being able to um, using cue mirrors and using external systems where we can choose to get up to eight monos or potentially, uh, you know, one workflow that's really great. We'll we'll talk about is one stereo cue and then six mono cues. Uh, as far as the number of cues go. Uh, I do believe it's inherent in the devices. It's in the the chips and in the uh, you know the way the the Apollos are designed that they're they're maxing out at four uh, cues. Yeah, and that's what, uh, yeah. Again, this this is all uh, everything. All the decisions that are being made here in terms of what you can and can't do when it comes to cues. Again, latency is always the number one thing that we're, they're thinking about here. It's like they. Um, and you know, for some of you who've been fortunate enough to work in a, in a say a larger studio with an analog console, you know this experience, right? Of like being able to plug in all your mics and your instruments, feed it through a large format console, feed that out to the headphone system, and just that like just the fact that it feels there's no difference in the playing feel. What you play comes immediately right back because it's just all electricity. Our goal with Apollo, with Luna, with console is to deliver that same experience and have it always be this amazing low latency reflection of whatever you're playing is what you're hearing and there's no buffer. There's nothing getting in the way of that. Yeah, it's, it took follow up on that. Bob is asking in the chat about being able to use why can't I use sends and or the direct outs of Luna or even the outputs or the flex route outputs of console. And uh, it's it goes to what Ben was just saying, that these things are all in, in the case of Luna, they're all in the native domain. Mm-hmm. And therefore, they're uh, not a low latency path. So you can't send from regular sends and you can't send from outputs because they're in the native side of Luna. So these cues, that's what's special about the cues. The cues are behind the scenes, they're DSP based, and they're not subject to any kind of uh, buffers or any kind of uh, delay compensation, for example, you can have a, a limiter on your master fader that has a lot of plug-in delay in it, and yet these cues are not going to react to that. They're still going to give you those low latency paths. So um, hopefully that clears it up for you, Bob. Uh, ask it about being able to send to the individual distinct outputs of that. You got to use the cues. That's how Luna and or console and your third-party DAW, that's how they know to access these sort of in the background pathways that are in the DSP only. Yeah, that's really it's it's such a key point. I'm glad you guys brought that up. Of yeah, the cues are really built to do exactly this one function, and the, this is what they do best. Um, yeah. Cool. So let me let me share my screen, and we'll keep we'll keep on moving forward. I think we're kind of caught up here on questions, but again, if you guys any questions that come up as we're going through this, throw them in the chat. We'll do our best to make sure we're touching on all this. We want this to serve as a great resource for you guys to come back and reference uh, in the future as you're setting up uh, different types of sessions, bigger or smaller. Um, so I'm going to switch to my screen here so I can show you guys, I've got uh, essentially what I've got here in my studio is an Apollo expanded system. So I've got a couple of rack mount Apollos as well as a twin. Uh, so I've got a little bit more IO, a little bit more cues, uh, available to me. Uh, and there's some really cool options, uh, that come because of that. Uh, so number one of those is a trick that we've actually, uh, I think we've shown before, but you'll see here in the cue outputs on my screen, make sure. Everyone can see this. Uh, so you see, I've got my three Apollos. I've got I've, I've configured my system for two cues. Um, like Drew mentioned, you can actually configure this up to four. This is a preference that you can set of how many different cues you have. Um, so you'll notice again. Typically, I'm leaving. I'll leave one of my cues on mix at all times. And I leave one separated uh, for being able to send Zoom calls or uh, be able to do any sort of special routing scenarios. A new option that you'll see on my system that you didn't see on Matt's is you see this mirror two. So what mirror two does is this allows you to send to an output on your primary Apollo device, uh, which in my case is a an X16 is my is my main number one unit, my A unit here in the top slot. So what this would allow me to do is if I had say a, a red box or a uh, hearback system or Aviami, I had something connected to my X16 and I wanted to be able to feed into it at low latency, this is where I would be able to do that, where I'd be able to say, cool, Q1, that's dedicated, my line one, two, that's where that's that Q should be heading. 
Um, and similarly for Q2, I could set up uh, multiple of these. And a lot of times when we were doing a, a larger tracking session, uh, this is one of the real key features for being able to send it back out into the studio to, to a headphone system. Uh, but the rest of this window is dedicated to the built-in headphone outs of my devices. So you'll see my Apollo X8, headphone number one, headphone number two. Uh, if you guys are familiar with, with these Apollos, you, 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 in your mind's eye, you can picture it right now, right? On the right-hand side, there's two headphone outputs. Uh, this was actually this is one of the things I kind of I didn't expect when I bought my first Apollo back in the day that those would actually be individual and I could address them with different things. So uh, as you see, you know, I leave mine set up this way so I can quickly put my headphone jack into number two, which I know is always my mix, or I can put it into number one, which is always my isolated Q send. Uh, like I mentioned, I I use for Zoom calls and other things. Um, but this allows you to quickly. If I wanted to change that up, I could come here into the software and say, hey, headphone one should be listening to Q1 and headphone two should be listening to Q2, which, you know, uh, some of you perfectionists out there are probably like, this This obviously is much better, but I prefer, I prefer it backwards for whatever silly reason. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and, uh, one thing worth noting about that mirror two menu before we move on, uh -huh. uh, once you select a pair of outputs from that mirror two menu, it actually makes those outputs unavailable in the driver. So if you were using oh. a different DAW, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. say you selected line one, two, and then you opened Ableton live or something like that, you actually wouldn't be able to send a line one, two, you'd have to send it the queue, which would then pass it on to line one, two. That's uh, a really key point. Good. Thanks for remembering that, Matt. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, this, this kind of dedicates that line one, two to being a Q send now. Is what you're saying. Yeah, it pulls it into that low latency DSP path and makes it unavailable for you know native stuff to send directly out to that output. Oh man, that's that's really good to know. And uh, yes, but as you mentioned, there is a way to still get to it, but you now address it as as you saw you know in the audio MIDI settings, right? Q one two, Q one left and right was available as a as a, a path to be able to send into. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Um, so this is how, so yeah, this is how you would manage your headphones. And then you notice here on my Apollo twin, you know, the Apollo twin only has one headphone out on the front of it, but it does have line three, four. And I've, I've seen some people ask this in the past, like, how do I get to, how do I access the line three, four to, you know, uh, I've used it for reamping or for sending out, you know, out through effects and back into my twin. Uh, the way that you do it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Matt, but this is essentially the best, best <clears throat> and only way to get to line three, four on your twin is actually send it to a queue that sends it out three, four, uh, for being able to do any sort of like reamp sort of scenario. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on the Apollo twin, it basically treats line three, four, like another queue output. So they aren't like direct assignable outputs, like on a rack mount unit. Um, you'd have to send to the queue and then route to them that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you don't see them in your D if you're in a third party DAW, you don't see them as available outputs. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. Um, and then you'll also notice here on, on the left side of my devices, there's a couple of icons that are important to know. Uh, so the little speaker icon next to a, this denotes which one of my Apollos is the monitor unit. So which one, when I send a monitor left and right, which one is powering my speakers in my studio essentially. Uh, so like I mentioned, I'm using my X16 for that, but you'll notice this other icon down here next to my twin, which is a microphone. And what this is brings us to our next really cool feature about Apollos for when you're doing a, a larger tracking scenario like this, talk back microphones. Like th this is one of the, like, I remember when this feature came out for Apollos, like there were people are like, they were either holy crap, finally I needed this. Or they're like, why would you ever, what, what would that be for? Um, you're either in one camp or the other. So you're either really into talkbacks or, or you've never really used them uh, necessarily. But essentially what this is, is there's a microphone built into the front panel of your Apollo that allows you to talk through the cues. Um, and so the options for that are right here, Matt. Uh, we were kind of looking at this earlier. And notice mine's going to be a little bit different than what Matt's was. Uh, so I can do a show control room. Uh, let's go ahead and hide the cue output here just for clarity. Let me zoom in for you guys as well. Oops, there we go. Um, so you can see now control room controls. So I can change my source. Again, by default, it's going to be on monitor. But if I wanted to listen to either of my cue mixes, I could press these buttons and that would change what comes out through my speakers to be uh, what I'm sending into a queue. The all important dim button. So whenever I dim my monitors, how much does it bring them down? Uh, very key for, for when you're dealing with talkback. And then right next to here is this talkback channel. 
Um, so what this channel is, this is my talkback microphone being brought into Luna. Uh, there's a couple of really cool things about it. Number one of which, so you can come up here and click on the sends and it brings up a talkback, uh, basically a, a fader package of where and how much am I sending in this talkback to different sources. Um, so if you, if you want to live dangerously, you can send your talkback to your monitor, to, to your, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, I struggle to think of exactly when you would use this, uh, but it's there. Uh, I guess maybe for like a SLS system, if you had loudspeakers in the studio hooked up to your monitors. But um, yeah, the, it's it's there. Don't be that careful be, when yeah, you turn that thing, on. <laughs> yeah, the only time I can think of using that is, let's say you were using your alt mons for, as you were saying, Ben, as SLSs or studio loudspeakers. So it's conceivable that when you go to alt, it would go to it would send to another room. At which point you'd want to talk to that room. But that's yeah, that's probably the only thing I can think of. Mm -hmm. And by default, uh, you'll notice it's already being sent to Q1 and Q2. It, it, the assumption here is, you know, if you have a talkback, you want to send it to a Q. Uh, but say you have a setup like mine where you're using Q2 to only monitor your mix all the time, uh, and you want Q1 to be dedicated for your performers, you may want to come in here and turn that off. Um, but I love that you, it's so it's very well indicated here, so you can quickly glance at it and see where it's at without having to open up this window. <clears throat> but also, this window floats. So you can leave this window up, hide the control room, continue, you know, start tracking, tracking your band or whatever. You still have at your fingertips, your talkback control. So you can quickly turn it on or off here. Um, but of course the, the real, the real best place to be hitting talkback on and off is on the front panel, uh, which you can do on, on, I think on, you can do it on all of the Apollos, correct guys? Uh, not yeah, silvers. Yeah. 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 Anything with the function yeah. uh, button, the assignable function button. Mm -hmm. And so that's a that's maybe important a little thing to show you guys here. So uh, go to console and uh, pull. It. Oh, my preferences are on the wrong screen. There we go. Maybe I'll do it here in settings. Uh, so the function hardware tab. There yep, you. hardware tab. Yeah. And then function switch assign. This is where this is where you would go to tell it what that function button does on the front of your Apollo. Um, so you can have it do multiple things. Uh, one of which is alt, alt two, which you know allows you to have a second set of speakers, be able to switch between them. You can have it mono your mix, you know, take your stereo, check it in mono. Dim, which just turns down uh, your turns down your monitors by that amount that I was showing you guys. Or most importantly, and, and most likely the one that everyone's going to use here is you can set that to be talkback. Um, and then, or better yet, Ben, get a twin, get a twin X, and put it on your desktop, and you have a dedicated talkback button, right? No need mm -hmm, to uh, yeah. assign a function switch. That's yep. that's of course that's the best solution. <laughs> that, that, is, that is that is definitely the best solution. Uh, yeah, I saw I saw some questions here in the chat asking uh, if you can only have two mix two Q mixes at a time. Uh, no, you can have up to four. Uh, and then, again, right here, I'm here in the settings. I'll show four. Yeah. Yeah, and Drew Drew will show some uh, some great uses for having the full four Q buses. Uh, but if you're like me, if you're in a smaller space that you're never going to actually need to use multiple, more than one or two cues, uh, you can set, you can bring that down a bit and it just it simplifies your IO uh, a little bit here. But this is where that, where that control is to be able to do uh, toggle between them. Yeah, um, speaking of the IO. Count actually, uh, real quick, I was going to say reducing the cue count actually saves you a tiny amount of DSP too. So if you're uh, like on the bleeding <laughs> mm -hmm. edge, how much DSP you have lowered it to two might help you uh, squeak out a couple more instances. Nice. And I was just going to say, speaking of IO, is that, that that this talkback mic is available in the IO matrix. It can be you can yeah. record it. You know, it's it's great for you know if you need to do a scratch vocal, if you have an idea and you don't have a mic set up, you can just record your talkback mic straight to a track and hum in your idea or, or latch it. Right? If you latch, if you press mm -hmm. and hold the talkback button, it'll latch. Uh, if you single press, actually, what is it? Single press it, it'll latch. And if you if you fast press it, it'll latch. If you press and hold, it will be momentary. And you could you know open up the mic and record a little idea on a mm -hmm. guitar or something. And you guys can, so what Drew was just mentioning, uh, if you guys are uh, unfamiliar with how latching and momentary stuff works, uh, it is it is a really cool function. So that, and it's also a very, very, very important thing to know when you're tracking a session with producers and high pressure clients, uh, to be very well aware of when your talk back is on and when it is off. Especially if you happen to be working with a producer who likes to shit talk the artists every once in a while, uh, <laughs> it's very, very important that you're careful with how you how you press and treat your talk button. So, that's this is worth it. It's, it bears repeating one more time here, Drew. Uh, so yeah. 
press a quick press. Yeah, fast press latches. Latch. So now talk. Yeah. My talkback is on. It's it's. You can see the green lights are going. Uh, my twin can hear me from across the room. So I'm yep. currently being sent to my headphone mixes. Press the talk button. Now my talkback turns off. However, if you want to just quickly be able to say, "Hey, let's do one more take of that," you can press and hold, and then as soon as I release my mouse, it it disengages the talkback button. Yep. Very. Don't get anyone in trouble, guys. I want you guys. I want you guys to <laughs> always be <laughs> conscious of when you are or not talking to your talent, especially if you have someone who likes to, uh, you know, make fun of the clients every once in a while. Uh, not speaking from experience here whatsoever. Um, <laughs> the other, the other thing, uh, you guys, I saw some people in the chat pointing out uh, one of the awesome things that you can do with Talkback Channel in Console and Luna is you can add plugins to it. So you notice. That, I, you know, I can have up to eight inserts here on my talkback. When I press the plus button, I can now assign. You know, so I can come in here and I can uh, I can add EQ, compression. I can add any of the UAD plugins I want to my talkback. Um, I know a lot of a few folks. What they'll do, you know, especially vocal producers, they'll throw auto tune on their talkback. You know, so if you're going to be trying to sing lines back to the artist and uh, you know, whether that's the sound or you just want that extra confidence and that what you're singing is perfectly in tune. So what they hear is perfectly in tune. You can throw auto tune in real time on your talkback microphone and send that back to them. Uh, you can add compression to it. So that way, especially if you're in a, in a larger control room, you know, if you've got the talkback mic up next to you as the engineer, sometimes it can be hard to hear, uh, what the drummer's girlfriend is saying on the sofa in the back of the room. <laughs> So this is where you would smash it into an 1176 and make sure they can as easily hear you as they can hear the drummer's girlfriend's opinion uh, coming from the back. Um, <laughs> which it's one, of, it's one of Fab's favorite jokes to make as well. So I got, I got to <laughs> carry the torch here. Um, but uh, so yeah, being able to do inserts, be able to control your talk back, control your dim amount, change your cue sources around, um, use multiple headphone outputs. This is, this is, we're still kind of really basing this around working with the Apollo system. So, uh, you know, what I see a lot of people do is they'll run headphone extenders. Uh, and I know this was, this was a really common question on that Greaves video drew was people are wondering yeah. like how, you know, there's two of them, there's two headphones, but the twin only has one headphone out. How, how did we do that the, through the magic of a Y cable? Uh, so yeah. you can, you can get these cables at, uh, that will, you know, the TRS cable, so they're still stereo quarter inch, but they can split a headphone out into two different outputs and drive two different headphones. Uh, but that way, you know, me and the artist can he be hearing the same thing through the headphone output. Um, and in that case, you know, you may want, you know, if you set up to a queue, you could use talk back if you're having trouble hearing each other, or, you know, if you're right next to each other, you can just take a one headphone off and easily to communicate <laughs> with each other. Um, but yeah, so headphone Y cables clutch, uh, and then also headphone extenders, you know, so I've seen plenty of people where in their permanent studio setups, they'll run headphone extenders out of the headphone front panel of their Apollo and then run those out, you know, through a 50 foot cable or whatever into the live room. Um, obviously, you know, long cable runs can sometimes be problematic uh, from a, a noise or a power issue, but also from uh, getting caught in the door and getting cut. <laughs> Again, not, not speaking from experience here whatsoever. Definitely not severed tons of headphone cables doing that <laughs> trick. Um, but yeah, white cables, extenders, uh, that allows you to use these Apollo inputs. And then the mirror to outputs, that really kind of leads us into you know, the the big studio, the the kind of the pro moves here, which, uh, which Drew is going to cover. Um, but I guess before we move, I, I have been ignoring the chat. Any good questions or things that we uh, touched on that we should diving deeper on drew or matt um i think you've pretty much covered everything as it's come up nice someone mentioned they use the uh, talkback mic on their uh, apollo for a drum crush mic which is awesome mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really cool tip that's a really cool one um let's see. i'm checking back through my notes now make sure we get I touched all the things oh one thing i didn't talk about was click tracks so we talked spent a whole bunch of time mm -hmm. talking about talkback but click tracks uh, click tracks are actually pretty similar to the talkback in terms of uh, what you can do here. And uh, we featured this uh, not too long ago when we were talking about the new uh, count in feature. So in Luna, uh, if you come up here, take on the in the click area of the menu bar, uh, you can see click. You know you have the controls over when you're getting the click track, how many how many bars of count in do you want, uh, but then also where is it being sent to? Uh, so you can have it sent to the outputs. 
or you can tell it send a queues here. Um, and this is this brings up again another floating window that allows you to quickly control how much of the click track is going to which queue. And again, you can come in here and turn those on or off very quickly. Um, so that's another really uh, kind of you know similar similar sort of thing as what I showed here with the talkback send. So I, I can imagine somebody in a tracking scenario. Uh, if you're tracking a band, I'm sure Danielle runs into this a bunch when she's working with bands and Luna. Uh, you know, kind of having these two windows at your disposal quickly, it, it kind of helps to keep them up when you're in that tracking mode and uh, and trying to get through stuff quickly and be able to confidently know what who's getting sent what at what time. Uh, so yeah, that's how you handle how you handle the click, and of course you know, you've got a just an overall a broad kind of click volume here. Uh, that you can you can bring up and down that controls the volume to your monitor um, quickly right here and then you have your cues are independent controls uh, and those are obviously being sent uh, you know regardless of what this is set at so yeah that is talk back talk back click twins expanded systems so Drew, check, let's let's check check. 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 Yeah, we're getting we're getting through we're getting we're getting through this. We're actually doing this in record time so far. Uh, so now now we're getting to like large studio, right? So this is kind of if you're say you're tracking a band. So far, everything we've done has been like working with a vocalist or working, you know, kind of more of an overdub sort of workflow, right? Like in theory, you yeah. could do a lot of this stuff with with a with a small band if they're all if they all want to hear the same thing or or kind of roughly have the same mix all going to them. Where it yeah. starts getting complicated is where you start having multiple instruments, multiple musicians. I want more drums. I want more me. I want more click. Like when people yeah. want choice over what they're hearing or what's coming to their headphones, this is where it takes a little bit of extra thought and, and care into how you set this up, uh, as well as just having the equipment. Uh, like a, uh, I know like what's really popular, like the Avion systems, Hearback. Yeah. There's Behringer, uh, the P16 system. Like there's a lot of these like personalized mixers uh the Furmans. oh man can't forget the Furman boxes yeah uh, yeah so drew what's uh, talk talk to me about as a tracking engineer like what what are you thinking about how are you approaching cues when you're working with apollos yeah well again as i mentioned earlier for me it's always you know it's just it's in a in a larger tracking session it's all monitor mixes me and that's just that's the way that's got to be and then you know for me four cues you know i notice a lot of people asking about more than four cues for me four cues is a luxury like you know i mean for many decades in the studio you'd have a couple of different cue mixes maybe two you know and i ran a commercial studio for many decades with two mm -hmm. and now going to a switch into apollo many years ago well several years ago it was it's been great to have four so um i find that four is really really good um I, me personally i have the three uh, my first three are sent to the, my my big room, the live room, and then I dedicate Q4. I have that hardwired to the vocal booth. So mm -hmm. um, in in my setup, that's that's how I have those. Uh, you know, it's sort of like baked into the system that there's three in the main room and one in the booth. Nice. And uh, so, like you, I use an X16 as my as my main unit. So they're mirrored off of that. Um, so yeah, I could show you that if you want. Yeah, um, let me uh, let me show your screen here. So this is. So you've got four cues. That's actually really smart and interesting that you have Q4 dedicated just for the vocal booth. So you always know if you're assigning yeah. Q4, that's whatever the, whatever the vocalist is hearing there in that room. Yeah, yeah, that's just the way. It just sort of happened that way. I needed to run the wiring through. You know, it's 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 through us. It's through my machine room. It's through a sound lock and in in this other room. So I kind of had to run the wire. I'm like, okay, well, I don't need to send all four cues there. I just I just dedicated the one Q4 to mirror to that. Nice. Um. So. Just to show you, this is similar to what Ben showed you. I'm going to go here to my Q outputs. And, um, you know, in my system, we have, uh, you know, I have it set to four. And I I use line outs of my X16 9 through 16. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is because I am using, I have my alt count. Um, I have my alt count set to to uh, two. Um, gotcha. So my Q, yeah, my Q count is set to four. Mm -hmm. And then my alt count is set to two. And, of course, on in the Apollo Expanded ecosystem the alt the the a unit you know the the master unit is responsible for it's responsible for the mon outs and alt mons as well as cues and it's also the clock master um so in my setup i have it set up that way 
where, you know, I have the dedicate and so I have them all not, you know, set to not mix turned on. Mm -hmm. I don't actually use, I don't look, I don't actually use these guys much at all because everything is outside of the control room. And then I have the twin, I, I do do the twin occasionally. If someone is in the control room with me and I'm going to do a headphone mix, you know, then I can dedicate, you know, the, the, uh, the main, the headphone amp of the twin to a, a given cue if as needed. Yeah. Well, it's also um, helpful too. Like, right. If you wanted to quickly monitor, you know, say the, the, the vocalist was in the booth being like, Drew, the, I can't hear what's going on. Like, you know, that's a quick way to diagnose, open that up quickly, yeah. you know, put, plug your headphones into your twin, yep. assign Q4, listen to what Q4 is getting. It lets you diagnose yep. it immediately. Like, oh crap. I, yeah. You're right. I totally forgot to send you, send you this level <laughs> or send you uh, the thing. Yeah, that's an awesome point. And, you know, like if you're an engineer working with other artists, like that's something you'd want to do like before they even walk in the door. You know, like if I have a mm -hmm. vocal session at 11 a.m., I'm in the studio at 1030 and I'm testing the mic, I'm checking the mic, I'm checking the headphone mix, I'm I'm doing all that stuff. So when they walk in, it's just like, you know, boom, you can get right to work. Such a, um, so such yeah, professional, a such, well, such a pro, man. Take care, well, you take care yeah. of your clients. Nice. I like well, it. Yeah, well, that's what you got to do. Right? <laughs> that's, that's what you got to do. Exactly. Uh, so Nice. So... So now, so Q1, explain to me kind of, now that you have those going out to multiple outputs on your X16, so on your patch bay now, those you know, those are getting presented on the patch bay and you just have them normaled into uh, your hearback system, right? Yeah, well, actually, I have I don't have a hearback system here, but I just use I have them hardwired. I don't even have them go to the bay. I have them directly ah. hardwired. Mm -hmm. Those outputs are dedicated to the cues, and I have them hardwired to uh, separate discrete headphone amps. Gotcha. Um, I mean, we are going to talk about avioms and hearbacks because I can I can sort of mimic the setup and show you how to do it without mm -hmm. having to have the hardware. But in my specific uh, uh, studio, I just have them mirrored to those outputs and they're hardwired, so it's right. dedicated well, that, to and that. that's such a that's a very traditional uh, way of doing it, right? I remember like the red headphone yeah. boxes were ubiquitous. Uh, so so for everyone that's you know watching along at home, so what this means is that Drew with his four different cues controls what each different box is getting. So you can mm -hmm. build, build a mix for, I guess, you know, the, per, the, whoever's in the drummer's position, right? The headphone yep. box that's next to them, say that's on Q1. That's, that's now your drummer. Q1, yep. That's drummer. That's the drummer's cue. So now you can, you know, this is where that copy to mix thing kind of really comes in handy really fast, right? Where you could just yeah. quickly bring your fader levels up to Q1. Boom. Now the drummer's getting what you're getting. And then he says, Hey Drew, uh, I can't hear my kick. Can I get more kick? He can now Drew can now just go in there and quickly add more kick uh, to what's being sent to to the drummer's headphones. Yeah, and typically I'll do things like it's nice to have that separate control because like I I track drums with a sub kick all the time, but you don't need to be sending the sub kick to the cans. <laughs> you're just you're just taxing the headphone amp and you know uh -huh. with no benefits. So as you can see on the screen here, so let's you know if this is the kick in and the kick out, I you know or sub kick, I'll leave it alone. Same with snare bottom. Like mm. snare bottom doesn't need to go to the headphones, you know. So for me, it's tip most drummers typically need, you know, kick, snare, hi-hat, right? Hi-hat's a big one because, you know, you put headphones over your ears, it muffles the top end, so you're missing all the articulation of the hat. So kick, snare, hat, and then generally just like some overheads, like just to give them that sort of the openness in the top end, kind of restore that stuff um, mm. is always is always good for me. Man, that's so smart. Um, I, had, I actually had never thought about that before, but you're so right that like what they're hearing or what they're feeling, you know, be able to just get bleed through the headphones. It's going to be low in energy. It's going to be kind of the low mids and all that stuff. Yeah. You, you could probably get through with, with less of, but yeah, it, you're muffling all the top in. Uh, that's where they're going to want more hi hats, more overheads than they're going to need. And they don't, like yeah, you made such a good point. You don't really need sub kick coming through your headphones for yeah. You're just you're just taxing those drive. Yeah, you're taxing those drivers. You know those little headphone drivers are trying to reproduce those that low end, and it's totally not necessary. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's you got to have a custom mix for that. Uh, yeah. And then of course, you know if, if this if this is the click track, then we can just we can just put that all the way up. Right there's your there's your, <laughs> there's your click track all <laughs> exactly. you know, just put that all the way up. Um, <laughs> So, so drummer, yeah, so I, I <laughs> yeah, dr sorry, drummers. I don't mean to, uh, <laughs> we don't mean to pile on. Um, so anyway, yeah. So in my studio that, you know, so the Q, Q1 is the drummer mm -hmm. is always, is always the drummer in my place. And I, you know, of course, obviously making them hear what they need to hear is, is of the utmost importance. And then let's just, you know, if we're just pretending here, uh, you know, obviously a decent bit of bass. And so if I, a lot of times with guitar, I'm tracking guitar, a mic and a DI, right? No need to send the DI to the headphones, uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, don't forget about effects, right? Don't forget about effects. If you're, if you're using, um, arm based, if you, if you're, if you're using buses that are in arm mode and so they're the, your live monitoring effects, then you want to send them to the mixes uh, as needed, um, which is always important. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and it's super important, uh, Drew. You mentioned the ARM mode, right? So in in Luna, you get and and I guess this applies to console as well. You have two auxes available. Um, so these these become incredibly important for if you want reverb or delay for your singer or for you know your musicians to be able to hear some space around what they're doing. You're gonna to want to make sure that those are ARM enabled uh, inside of yeah. Luna. Uh, and again, we'll show you guys how this works on console because it's the same sort of thing. We have aux one and aux two available. It's essentially what Luna is using to power these low latency uh, effects. Uh, yeah. But you know the way a lot of people end up using it too is as a crush, as a thing that kind of like glues elements together. So you can send uh, you can send your drums and your bass and you know, smash them through a channel strip or eleven seventy six and get this kind of like gritty kind of underlying thing, which is a, a whole bunch of energy as like a parallel compression in real time and then feed that to the headphones because man musicians they feed off that sound they feed off of like yeah hearing so especially if you're doing like rock or something more aggressive where they want to hear that punch and that character coming through send it you know send it into a crush bus send that into their headphones even if you don't end up using that much of it when you mix um i think we showed this uh jakir did a great example of this when we were doing the the rock recording master class last year he had this going live. He had a, a distorted, he did it both for the vocals and also I think for the drums, this like distorted crunchy thing that he would sneak up in there, feed into their headphones to help feed into their performance and give them like, dude, you guys are yeah, rocking. Hypes, like this. hypes it up. Yeah. It does. It, it totally does. Um, so yeah, but, and you get two of those. So a lot of times, yeah, using one for a parallel crush thing and then one for like a delay or reverb or, you know, some, some, uh, something that kind of spreads out the sound a little bit. That's a great yeah. use for those two. Um, but then you guys will notice other, you know, even if you turn up the cue on a non arm aux, it won't send signal to it because nothing will be going into that aux unless it's arm enabled while you're tracking. And then as soon as you're, you know, playing back, then of course it'll activate. Right. Right. Yeah. And a couple of things I don't think we've mentioned just yet, you know, some people, uh, uh, you've got some little helpers and some little shortcuts that'll help you. For example, option clicking, right? If you option mm -hmm. clicking on a cue sets it to zero. Uh, also option clicking on a mute will mute all. Yep. So this is nice. This is nice during playbacks when, you know, if, if you've opened the door between the control room and the studio and you're playing back the track, you know, you don't need to hear those headphones, those poor headphones with the click track at plus eight, you know, from the drummer, you know, <laughs> yep. so you can, you can, you can mute those headphones. We also have the ability to hold down command allows me to control the volume of all of them. So this is a good way of, if you have a complicated mix, let's just say I have a bunch of stuff up here uh, and I want to adjust them all at the same time. I can just, I can grab command and, and it adjusts all of them at the same time, which is a you know nice way of being able to adjust your entire cue mix up and down as well as muting it and so forth. Nice. Um, awesome. So that's, so this is kind of a, this is a great, great way to get into this. So this is the four Q, you know, so four Q boxes. And then you as the engineer, now you've been in charge of creating those mixes for each musician and, and what they need, yeah. uh, which, you know, again, it takes, it takes a little bit of extra preparation, but then once you're all set up and tracking, it can be as easy as just leaving it set at, as it is adjusting as they ask for it. Uh, and yeah. as you're shown here, you can have these big faders so you can quickly kind of look over and see what all's going on. Yeah, and this is a great uh, opportunity for a new alternate window. You know, if you do a new mm -hmm. alternate window, you can kind of dedicate one of the windows to having all of your cues ex blown out and expanded out. And you can, if you you know, if you double click on your faders, you can shrink your faders down and get more real screen real estate for the cues. And if you're in an if you have this in an alternate window off to the side, you can really have a second window that mm -hmm. is like almost exclusively. Uh, cue based and you can ha kind of have that off to the side and just be like oh i gotta grab my cue i gotta go grab my cue meantime on your main monitor you're you have you're looking at uh you know your entire your your own mix and you can you know your own mixer nice so now a uh, couple couple things i see come up all the time uh people are always curious can you use you know we showed it, you showed it with uh line outputs feeding your things can you do that with digital outputs? Could you use like an ADAT uh, output on an X8 to, to feed yeah. your headphones? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's a great workflow that a lot of people use. I, I, my monitor unit like yours is an X16, so I don't have ADATs on there. But in the Q output section, uh, when you go to the mirrors, uh, you know, you will see, well, and I, you can see it here. I can see the AS EBU. So that's available as a mirror were I to try and, you know, want to feed or mirror something uh, to, a, to, to a digital. So if you have an ADAT enabled system, 
like an X8P or X8, they'll be in there as well for mirrors. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind, it's only on the A or the monitor unit. The monitor unit is a special unit that is responsible for the cues. And I think that that's an important thing that uh, trips up a lot of people that like the order of your Apollos does matter. Uh, so it's really important. The first in the, the A unit, right, is always the one that's first in your chain uh, yeah. with your Thunderbolt cable. So the Thunderbolt comes out of your computer into your A unit of your Apollo expanded system. So uh, if you want that to be your X16, if you want that to be your X8 or X8P, uh, it matters which one you put there because it does enable some extra features, especially when it comes to cues like this. You actually don't even need to put it first in the chain. It could be the second in the chain. You can drag it up to the top and it'll still work. Uh, oh, what? That's pretty forgiving in that regard. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. That's, that's in this window, right? Yeah, exactly. So if Drew grabbed any of those other Apollos down there, he can actually drag them to the top and they instantly become the uh, the monitor. Yeah, it'll become without the a having unit. to change the physical order of the Thunderbolt cables. Yeah, it's Even part better. of the, it's part of that A designation. Um but I you know Ben Ben's Ben's point is good. I do I don't know if it's just the OCD in me, but like <laughs> part, I, they got to be connected in the order in which they are. Like I you know, I, I don't know, yeah. it just feels like they it just feels like the right thing to do. So, uh and possibly when you have multiple, you know, I have two X8Ps, so um it just feels like the right thing to do to have them connected. But technically it's not supposed to matter, but I I just can't have it. <laughs> it makes it easy to remember what's what though for sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 Especially if you're on a patch bay, right? If they if you it just it helps to always kind of keep everything in line so when you're thinking line 1, uh, all right, yeah, line one this one like yeah yeah help, helps to keep it straight um, i actually just helped i just helped uh, troubleshoot a dual x16 user and he who had his cues coming off of the b unit and yeah we had that exact thing because they were actually thunderbolt connected the wrong way or you know not the wrong way but out of order and it messed with our heads as we were doing our troubleshooting so definitely put them in order just put them in order <laughs> <laughs> nice uh so cool so you can use eight outs uh you can you know, can mirror you can use line outs so now so this has been, you know, like I said, we've been using cues to send to certain musicians, but this kind of all gets flipped a little bit on its head when you start using an Aviom or a hearback system where the yeah. goal is to kind of give musicians in the room their own mixes and their own controls. Um, and so Drew, you mentioned, you know, this is a way that you can actually get eight of them if you do them all with mono, but there's a really highly recommended way of doing it with like one stereo and then six monos. Yeah, this is, and this kind of ties in with what we said earlier. So for example, like a, a one, a, a nice workflow um, might be, well, it depends on what you're doing. If you're doing an overdub session, then it can make sense to send your main to the first, to the, to the Q1. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're doing overdubs with lots of existing tracks, however, if you are doing a, a, a tracking session from scratch, then that workflow doesn't work because everything's going to be in arm mode. Um, so let's say, let's say, uh, so, and what we're, what we're referring to here is this idea of doing one stereo mix using let's say q1 mm -hmm. and feeding it and mirroring it out to a stereo pair on your aviomer here back and then using the other cues two three two three and four as mono feeds um to, to do six sort of more me kind of things um so there's a couple different ways to handle this for example drums like if you look at drums you know drums are often eight ten twelve fourteen tracks trying to send all of those discreetly out to a, to a, to a headphone system is kind of silly. So, you know, why not use Q1 to basically send a, a, a really nice stereo mix of your drums to Q1. Mm -hmm. And then on the other cues, uh, let's say, so let's just pretend we've done that. Uh, well, actually I can just kind of, I can just, uh, bring these guys up and pretend we've done a mix here and then Q2. So then you, you, the other cues, uh, the other cues become, uh, mono feeds. They can we can turn them into mono feeds. So let's say we're just talking about uh, Q2 on the bass. Mm -hmm. uh, so by by panning it hard left and then option clicking to set it to unity gain, and along with my mirrors that are going to you know for Q2 is line out 11 and 12. Um, now this bass is going only to output 11. It's mm -hmm. only going to 11, not 11 and 12 because I've hard panned it. Um, and then on the second guitar on the guitar. If I use Q2 also, but pan it all the way to the right, then it's only going to 12. So in that way, we've taken 11 and 12, which are a ganged pair or mm -hmm. a linked stereo pair, and we've turned them into two mono feeds. Um, yeah, that's such, and a, then, it's such a trick, right? So this way, like, you know, if you guys are familiar with the Avioms or the Hearbacks, like now, you know, fader number one, that's their stereo pair. That's their drum mix. They can just turn that up. But then, you know, uh, knob number two is bass. Boom. Now the bass player can crank himself guitar player can get just enough that he needs this allows your musicians to now 
no and of course you know if you're again if you're being a good steward of a good engineer you've gone in and labeled the headphone boxes you know told the musicians here's drums here's where bass guitar and allow them to build these mixes as they like um yeah. and so the real power the the super big trick here is remembering that you can pan to send it to just one of those lines uh so this is you know when i've worked with Shakir on sessions we've he's set all his stuff up exactly like this where Drums are going out this stereo pair, and then a bass track, a guitar track, a second guitar track, and then a vocal track, and then maybe uh, an effects return. Like it really allows you to to send exactly what the musicians need to then craft a mix for themselves. Yeah, and you know it's one of those things where like you know, for me, a drummer doesn't need you know it, make them a you know make them a great mix. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like get good get good sounds and create a nice headphone mix and send it there. Um, and you know, we, we mentioned this earlier, but let me, I can bring it up again here, this idea of the source down here, right? We've yeah. spoken about this a few times. Um, and the, this is a really important thing when you're making these headphone mixes, um, is to be able to go in there and, and punch through and listen to that mix. So in the case of, in case of the drum mix, I can simply hit this Q, Q1 mix and work on that mix, uh, that I'm sending over to the drum, to the drums, um, which would, you know, which would be here. So I can send him a nice mix. Uh, and then everybody else is go getting their discrete outputs. Nice. Uh, um, and you got a good question here from Daniel asking about the more me kind of theory. Uh, and so this is, uh, <laughs> there's another, a, a slight variation of what we just explained where we are setting up, yeah. you know, one, two is your drums, three is bass, four is guitar and, and on and on. There's another way that you can do this where you could use that stereo one to be the whole band. So yep. and a lot of times the way I would do this is I would take my cues out of pre-fader and put them into post-fader. So that way my big faders at the bottom are now controlling the level of everything. And I would just unity gain across that top. So now mm -hmm. Q1 is basically a copy of my mix of what I'm hearing in the control room. And that's getting fed to the first knob on the hearback system. And then I would dedicate, you know, as Drew was showing here, you know, the bass on channel three, drums on channel four, you know, you can do mono yeah. more me's that if the drummer wants more of themselves in the mix, they've got the stereo baseline, you know, the good mix that's coming from the control room. They've got that on their first fader. Now they've got a, a simple drum knob for more drums or more bass or more vocal that they can blend and add into the mix. Um, yep. And a lot of times this, it's a great way, especially uh, for younger bands, for, you know, for people who aren't as comfortable fiddling with knobs and, Man, I, I can only tell you the number of times that this happened in sessions where they would, they couldn't find things. They'd say they couldn't really figure <laughs> out. They were uncomfortable. They couldn't hear things. I'm like, dude, I'm sending you like full. You would just walk out into the control and listen yeah. to their headphones for two seconds. You know, for us, it's like second nature to quickly balance things. But to a musician who doesn't do this often, it can be very daunting to try and get a good yeah. balance and something that actually helps them perform. Uh, so being able to do give them that confidence, give them, hey, here's a good mix. And then if you need more click or if you need more bass, just turn knob number three or turn knob number four yeah, that's to that, add more. That's that them. more, the more me theory. It's yeah, that's, that's the essence of it is to send them something really good, something nice. It's also great for effects. That way you can send the more me, the, the bass mix, you know, the foundational mix can have a generic sort of comfort reverb that mm -hmm. is at a fixed amount. And then literally as people add the more me, they're actually kind of drying it up as well. Like they can, they can set themselves back into the mix and maybe they hear a little bit more of the reverb that you might have in the control room. And then as they up the more me, they're actually drying it up and pulling it to the front of the mix. So it's it's kind of like double duty in that sense even. Mm -hmm. uh, perfect question from uh, from Art here asking, are there phase issues when you're doing a more me mix like this? That's the, that, is the that is the really cool part, man. All of the Q outputs, all of the outputs that are happening here in real time, they're phase aligned. They're all, they yep. stay together. So by doing it this way, and this is why it's important, uh, Matt mentioned this a little bit earlier too, right? Like the reason why you don't use direct outputs on channels to, to feed these things, or reason why you, you want to use the Q system to power this stuff is that it, it locks these outputs in phase all together. Yeah. Now that, that leads us to a, a, another important point here is that if you're, whenever you're multi micing something and you're, if you're tracking a bunch of live musicians, then you want to make sure that you've got your input delay compensation on, uh, input mm -hmm. delay compensation applies uh, the, the appropriate 
delay compensation to to all of your input signals before they're presented to the disc you know to, for recording um so yeah with as so long as this is on then you're you can this will take care of compensating for any inputs that are any delays that are induced in your input section uh unison preamps and you know whatever else you're doing on a per channel basis for processing so make sure you got this guy on i personally we've talked about this before i personally like it i always keep it on short even if you don't you can keep it if you're just doing one mic to one track you can totally turn it off mm -hmm. i i personally like it on short because uh it's it's unobtrusive and then if i ever get myself into a situation where i have induced too much delay mm -hmm. it will tell me but yeah. if it's off if it's off it won't tell you so you exactly like to keep it on short it's more it's it's a safeguard to let you know like you know say you put on like precision multiband you put on a uad <laughs> plugin that causes a lot of latency yeah. there's just no yeah. way around it um it'll let you know it'll be like hey 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 by the way just let you know you're going beyond and that's where you start we would potentially have phasing problems if you choose to move forward uh but that keeps you in check and that is a great little safeguard for yourself to know that like man all my outputs are staying phase accurate with each other yeah nice yeah uh good comments bob asked a great question about panning the click uh to the left or right as we're showing these same tricks uh so at the moment uh hit the feedback button let the team know that you want to be able to, to pan uh your click to cue but the the quick little quick little workaround for this that i've seen a few people do uh is they would print a click say like print a bar of the click track bring it back into the session as an audio track and now when it's when your click is in there as an audio track you lose some of the you know quick uh functions that you get from the dedicated click control inside of luna but you now get some extra controls in terms of routing it for the cues or sends um, and being able to obviously keep that printed inside of your session as well. So there's, there's a fairly quick workaround for that at the moment, but definitely hit the feedback button and let the team know that, uh, that you guys need that feature as well. Yeah, and I guess one, the only, the last thing that I wanted to show was it's it's not specifically, you know, cue related as far as tracking. And I've, I, we actually showed this once last year, um, but I figured I would show it again since we're digging into these cues. And it's just, it's more of a mixing trick uh, or tip for utilizing reference material inside of your mixes. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know about you, but like when I'm mixing, I'm always referencing either maybe a rough mix or maybe I'm maybe I'm referencing another engineer's mix of this song. I've been hired to remix the song. Or maybe I'm referencing, uh, you know, some material that I know the artist likes or enjoys, or maybe all the above. So in this session, you'll see down here, I've got, I've got my, uh, uh, I've added uh, four tracks here. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just labeled them just for the purposes of this demonstration. I've just labeled them ref one, ref two, ref three, and ref four. And you'll notice that they're muted, right? They're assigned to the main output, but they're muted. Um, and the concept here is that, and I actually don't have any tracks. I don't have any audio on here. So there's, you know, just pretend that there's mixes on here. But the idea is that these are my four reference material, four reference choices, a rough mix, other engineers mix and, and other things. And you'll notice that on the cues, the first one I've set to, um, I've set to a, sent it to Q1, mm -hmm. uh, pre-fader. And so therefore the mute doesn't impact it. And I've set it to minus six. Why minus six? Because this reference track is probably a, a mastered record that is, you know, been probably, hopefully not, but probably limited to within an inch of its life. Uh -huh. um, and and so I've got that down. And let's say I've done the same thing here to reference number two. And and you'll notice that I'm I'm cascading them. Ref one is going to Q1, ref two to Q2, three and four, et cetera. And the basic idea here is when I hit play, I'm listening to the main output of my mix. And, um, but what it allows me to do is it allows me to come over here and click Q1. Mm -hmm. And now I'm monitoring this ref mix that's not even playing in my mix. Of course, it's not going to my master fader. It's not going to go through any of that. It's going directly in a, to the Q and it allows me to hear that. So now I can listen to my mix, ref one, ref two, ref three, and ref four. And then yeah, finally back so to my cool. mix. Man, that's, yeah, that's like such a, a tr such a trick, and like so, this is this is super useful, right? For like, if you have a rough mix of the song that the band's like, hey, like you know, we love this about the, re the about the rough that that we did the day of tracking. This allows you to just with a button switch between the mix that you're listening to now, and then go back to a ref, go you yeah. know, go to a commercially produced thing, go to the you know the demo that the band did back in their garage. Like it allows yeah. you to quickly go between multiple sources. And all of it level compensated. So you're not crushing your master fader, putting a limiter on it, trying to reach this sun, mm -hmm. some un <laughs> unobtainium, right? Yep. Like referencing, you know, refer comparing your mix to a mastered mix without level compensating for it is is you're is doing yourself a disservice. It, it's you want to hear, 
you want to hear it level compensated. So down, you know, you're, you're probably going nowadays at least six, maybe even eight, eight or, you know, nine DB mm -hmm. down. So yeah, that's, that's just a great workflow trip, you know, trick for being able to reference a bunch of different stuff at, at, at a time. Nice. Well, uh, man, we, so this is, that's, we've, I think this is in terms of Luna and Q's go, we've kind of covered, oh, yeah. we've covered the, the variety now, like we've covered start to finish, uh, simple stuff, moderately difficult stuff, and then more like full on tracking stuff. Uh, before we dive into working with, uh, other DAWs and console and kind of translating some of the stuff we just showed you guys here in Luna and how it would work in other DAWs, uh, let's just check in here on the questions because I've seen a, a lot of really good ones come in. Um, when Brendan was asking, you know, can you have two sets of monitors on an Apollo twin? And the answer to that, I believe, is yes. Right? You can have the alt monitor function and use line three four as your second set of monitors. Yep. Yep. Right. Nice. Um, Jeffrey was asking, can you expand your Apollos to more than six units? No, you cannot. In fact, you can actually it, only it, use it, four Apollos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four. It's six devices total, four of which can be Apollos, one of which can be a desktop. So that's the right. breakdown: six, four, and one. And that's primarily a Thunderbolt issue. It's a, Thunderbolt has uh, th each Thunderbolt bus has uh, six device IDs that, as soon as your system comes online and the computer reaches out to them across that bus, it's assigning them a device ID, and that limit is six. So. Theoretically, you could do another bus or whatever, but it's just not not possible now. Yeah. So yeah. Yep. So if you need more IOs, then more sixteens, I guess, would be the uh, <laughs> yeah. the thing yeah. there. Uh, volume master and mute for cues. Fun jazz puzzle. Yeah, I agree. Hit the feedback button. That's the yeah. yeah in the workaround is what I showed. You know, being able to being able to option click is option click and command drag allows you to mute all and or trim all. So yep. you can use that in the meantime, but yeah, definitely hit the feedback button. It would be great to have a master key section and have them nameable. I would like it nameable. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Paul Osborne, how do you route the click? How do you route to print a click track as an audio? Uh, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, Matt knows that one. Yeah. Matt I was like, Matt, that you've one, done that one, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think probably the easiest way is just, um, you can basically mute all your tracks. All right. Let me open uh, Luna again here. Sorry. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Matt. I oh, didn't I, I, can, I can switch. I can switch to mine here. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. So the quickest way to do it, right, would be to, you know, go off into the distance. You know, just go go somewhere randomly over here, uh, and then create a audio track. It can be mono or stereo, and then set the input of your monitor track of that track to be monitor left right. And then and now mute it first. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> mute it. <laughs> Don't forget. Mute. Turn on your click. Hit record. And so now I have a quick little, you know, and I, I personally, I just do this for like a bar. So I would just do a quick little thing like that, capture a bar of it, and then copy paste across my timeline to fill it in. Um, and then now, you know, as I mentioned, now this track has full facilities over the queues where I can, you know, I can now pan it uh, and do what I please. And the cool thing is this still works with tempo changes. It's still, you know, since the track I made is in tempo mode, uh, it will follow the tempo. It'll expand and contract and stay in time. Um, and I know a lot of people have used this trick to, to do custom uh, metronomes, right? So you can just drag in a cowbell yeah. or whatever sound you like uh, and basically treat an audio track as your click track uh, for working. Yep. Nice. Nice. Uh, yeah, no, the reason I live up, um, I have a pretty cool trick for similar to like Drew's thing. If you want to be able to mm -hmm. hear reference material not through your master track, mm -hmm. um, for anybody that doesn't use Luna or wants to do it in a, a non Luna DAW, um, basically the way I do it in live, so I have like a, a master chain on my master track, which normally everything would go through the master track. Um, instead of sending tracks out, let's say I had re reference material on this reference track, I can send directly to the monitor left and right outputs, which is one and two. Um, so I'm still hearing it through the same exact outputs as everything else in the session, but it's not going through the master track and not going through the mastering chain. So it's a great way to reference material, not through your, your master bus processing, um, without yeah. having to switch outputs or do anything like that. Nice. Yeah. That's a really, really cool shortcut for being able to quickly go between the two. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Yeah. And then you can just uh, keep it turned off and then, you know, solo it when you want to hear it, unsolo it and you're hearing your, your track against it. That's the way to do it. Uh, Angelus was asking if this, this session will be saved on our Facebook page. Yes, it will be. 
Yep. It will. This you can always come back and refer to this episode later. Uh, Chris was asking if there's a diagram uh, of how to set up, how to set the stuff up. Uh, Drew, is, are there any resources like over on the forums or anywhere? Yeah, that- actually, you know who did a great video is Todd Urban. Uh, if you go to YouTube and go to Todd Urban Sound Studio, Todd Urban, he did a he did a video showing you exactly how to set it up with a, an Apollo Eight and a hearback system. So. Uh, you just go on YouTube and it's U-R-B-A-N Todd Urban and you'll find his page. He's got lots of great videos on there. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, one of them is a hearback video. So definitely check that out. Nice. Max 2020 is saying, oh, so the X4 can be added to the four rack Apollos? That's correct, right? No. So you get a four, you get, or uh, would it be three three racks and an X4, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, four, exactly. Uh, four Apollos total, one of those can be desktop. Gotcha. Or right, So you could have four racks if you wanted. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you yeah. could have four yep. racks or one desktop, three racks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Or six satellites. Those mixer people. <laughs> <They're> just mixing <laughs> yeah. six satellites. And the with satellites, those can you run those on a separate Thunderbolt bus, or do those have to still be on the single? It's still bus? six. Yeah, yeah, it's still six. Yeah, uh, that's you know because your device, your UA device, everything is based around that six device limit. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Nice. Uh, and Danielle was following up on 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 the click trick that we we're using. Uh, I, Love this trick, Daniel. Uh, using percussion loops as your click track. So, like pulling in a shaker loop or a tambourine, like just pulling in loops in general at the serves your click track. I endorse one hundred percent because man, that feels so much better than a click, 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 just like nailing yep. you in the ears. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice, um, awesome. Well, so yeah, I think we're we're all caught up on questions. Uh, sorry, Mike. Caught up, yeah, they caught up on what mics, what mics we're using. <laughs> Sure. Uh, this is I'm using the Latin Audio LS208. It's like their broadcast condenser microphone. Right. I'm using a Sound Deluxe U195, which is a di- large diaphragm condenser. It's fancy, fancy pants over there. It is fancy. <laughs> and, and Matt's Mine's got the SM7. Obviously, <laughs> it's like the <laughs> everybody knows that one. Exactly. No yeah. one has to ask what which one that one is. <laughs> yep. Um, it's uh, is 4Q mixes a software or a hardware limit? 4Q mix, as I understand, it's a hardware limit, right? Yeah, I believe yeah, I believe it is, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it actually has to do with how many pads the, the DSP inside of the unit has, and uh, we only have four open, so that's all we can do for now. But mm-hmm. nice. it's another good feedback thing. Totally. Joel's saying he bought an LS208 and he blames it on me. I'm sorry I'm sorry, you had to get a good mic. <laughs> Apology accepted. Um, all right, so so guys, we've been, t- we've been showing this all in the context of Luna, which, uh, as I mentioned... You know, part of the reason why we made Luna was to to really make it a powerhouse when it comes to re, you know not just mixing but also recording and tracking and monitoring and all the stuff that we've been showing you. Uh, we, we, this makes it look like it's really easy, and it, it doesn't get that much more difficult when you when you split this out because so much of what we just showed you carries over into working with console and console kind of ends up doing a lot of the functions that we showed you guys in terms of sending things to different queues panning you know assigning your line outputs or your ADAT outputs like all this stuff this is now console mirrors a lot of that functionality but there are some really key considerations mm-hmm. to make when you are using uh when you when your ultimate destination is a daw uh, and how you're going to be routing and selecting all these things um and drew you, you you're pretty you're familiar with with these workflows yeah. from back in the day yeah uh, it, it pains me. It pains me that we have to go backwards in time like this because, <laughs> you know, we just got done showing how awesome Luna is at this. And, you know, as a longtime tracking engineer, a longtime Pro Tools user, like one of the things that Luna that's drawing me to Luna is the this integration and the simplicity. It's just like it's so much. Everything is just all in one place. And I can it's so much. Uh, it's so great to have all of this in front of me. Um, but occasionally I do still I still do work some in Pro Tools and have to, you know, have to. Uh, go through some of this. And yeah, and as you said, Ben, the majority, a lot of this is basically set up and essentially, um, essentially the way, the best way to think about it is that in Luna, you simply have one set of cues Mm -hmm. inside of Luna. We have, we have, we still have the same, everything's the same. There's still four stereo cues, or you can still break it up exactly everything that we just said. The difference is, is that, um, in Luna, the cues are unified inside of Luna's mixer. Um, if you're working with another DAW, let's say, and maybe, uh, you want to go ahead and share screen, Ben? Let's, you know, and I'll try and keep this as simple as we can, because um, the basic idea here is that everything we said is the same, except one thing. And that is that you now have a separate set of cues and a separate set of cue sends for your input path mm-hmm. and and then also for your playback path. So mm. I don't really have this set up legitimately, but let's just pretend 
um, you know, let's just pretend that I'm uh, here I am. Uh, and actually, I'm monitoring the queue. So if, if you want to get a, some insight into what we're doing and how we're, we're listening to ourselves, you'll notice that my mic is muted in the main output. So I don't feed that back to Ben. And meantime, I'm able to hear myself via the cues. Uh, so actually, I'll use a dummy track over here, a dummy channel over on the side. But the basic idea is that when you're using console and a third party doll, you want to manage the, the cues that you're doing inside of console are what we, you know, are your input cues. In other words, they're, they dictate what the live inputs to console or to your Apollos, how they get to the headphones. Mm -hmm. um, and, and along with that are your two auxes. So the two auxes are your input effects or your input cues. Um, and so as you build a session up, right, um, as you work on things, I, ha I have two, my 2XAP. So here I'm building my monitor mix in the control room on these faders, mm -hmm. and then I'm building cue mixes uh, and, and when I would work, when I work in console, um, it's nice to put these, uh, guys on the sends and then you can, you can jump to your queue. So now you're looking at all of your queues and, and same with console. I'd put this on a separate window and, and be able to jump around to my queues and you can see your various, your, your four queue sends. So you're basically building input, input mix, input queues, right? Um, and that, that gets, that handles the live audio. And then when you jump over to a DAW, Essentially, what you're doing is you are uh, essentially what you're doing is you're replicating that, but for the playback side. Mm. So, so this way, so, so, you, so you'd be listening when you're tracking live, everything's happening in console, right? So, what you're hearing as the engineer, what your musicians are hearing, that's all based on the faders and the, the sends that you set up over in console. And exactly. now, now, what Pro Tools is doing is it's capturing those inputs, but it's actually, it's not out, you're not hearing post fader out of pro tools when you're doing this you're kind of you're leaving it muted this that's it this is the important option right there yeah low yeah. latency monitoring so what this does in pro tools is it says hey pro tools record all this stuff in and as soon as i as soon as i'm done recording and press play i want to hear it all back but while you're in the act of recording when you're in low latency monitoring like this that says hey you know what uh, the, some other device is handling the the input monitoring which in this case is is console and your apollo that's handling right. what you're hearing in real time. And then Pro Tools just becomes a playback device for you. Exactly. Yeah. So with low latency monitoring on, that basically mutes the inputs. It mutes the inputs um, to the track. So for, you know, for example, when I uh, record enable this mic, it's, it's, it, Pro Tools is saying, yeah, record that audio, mm -hmm. but don't output it because it, there is a direct path, a direct monitoring path, a low latency path, which in our case is console. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what's happening here. So now these mixes now become, and, and, and you know, here's the spoiler alert. Here's, you have to maintain two separate sets of mixes, right? You know, yep. that's, that's, this, you can now see why Luna is amazing at tracking and it's, you know, is an amazing for me. I having that centralized unified place to control the cues is awesome. There's mm -hmm. also the effects side of it. So for example, in console, um, when I'm in console and let me just go back to the other view, I, I might, ha I have to have a dedicated reverb over here that's in in my aux let's just you know if we we can just throw the uh uh god i'm so used to my type ahead you know jeez uh so you know i we have you know we can have we can have this reverb here and then have me send stuff to it right um and and bring up you know the the, the feed from that reverb and that's going to handle the reverb side for the input path but when it comes time for playback, I have to basically replicate that here in Pro Tools with another, you know, instantiation of that so that the playback has the similar reverb. Now, there are some, I, I do have some tricks that allow you to, uh, whatever track you happen to be recording on, mm -hmm. I, one of the tricks I do all the time is I have dedicated, I have dedicated, I use virtuals, I use virtual uh. returns and you'll notice I have them set up, uh, two of my virtual channels set up as return one, return two. I do that for to have either two mono or to be able to use a stereo return, mm -hmm. which is great for um, like if you're using the Townsend mic at the same time. Um, but anyway, so what this does is by setting your by setting your the track you're working on uh, to to a to a return one, then what happens is it gets the signal for for recording, and upon playback, it will play back live into console, and you can see that I have mine over here. And so return one, I can open this up and I can send this to the same reverb ah, that I'm using for the live. So that's now, tricky. I like that. Yeah. 
one instantiation, one version of the 140 is is handling both my live mic, you know, which is over here, mm -hmm. um, and then also the return. And so anyway, hopefully that's making sense. I know it's a little bit convoluted, but you know, the, the moral of the story is just use Luna. <laughs> um, you know, that's really, that's, I mean, I, I just can't say that enough. You know I mean? Uh -huh. uh, it just puts it all in one place. I mean, God, imagine this. I mean, it, it, Luna just solves that. This is what, you know, it solves all these problems, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't well, know. Hopefully that's making sense. Any, any, any questions there, Ben, anything no, coming up in the chat? No, uh, I haven't seen any, no. any relevant questions come in yet. If you guys, yeah, if you guys do have questions about doing this console plus, Pro Tools or live or other, uh, drop drop them here in the chat. But you know, yeah. one one of the things I really want to highlight here is like the cool thing that you can do in in console that I think a lot of engineers find themselves doing uh, inevitably is creating templates for themselves. I know Drew, you had this sort of setup too, yeah. right? Where you could basically set you can make a console session for tracking a live band where you have your default. You know, boom, these are going these are most likely my drum mics. Set them up Q one, boom, that's all preset. You know, yeah. bass guitar. Mm -hmm. You could have all these. Your, your typical tracking configuration set up uh, so you could quickly recall your plug, your unison settings, your record effects, your cues, your aux sense. You could recall all that information with a console preset. And, you know, especially if you're working on an album, you know, it's worth, you're going to spend, you know, spend a little bit of time getting this, all these settings styled in and building the headphone mixes. But then once it's set, you're good to go. Like you're, you can now, you know, proceed to work, save it work on a different project, come back and quickly instantly recall those same settings for your musicians. So it's a seamless experience like that. Um, yeah. but again, you know, the, the, the real, the only, the only actual trick that it makes this a, a kind of a cumbersome workflow is having to go back and forth between the two and, and, you know, knowing that your console, the monitoring that's happening inside a console, that's just, it's all happening in real time, but it's also, it's always happening. Right. So this would be the thing sometimes you'd run into, especially when you go to do overdub style workflow, right? Is the, say you're a vocalist, you would hear the playback of your track coming from Pro Tools, uh, but then you'd also be hearing your live input at the same time. So you start singing along to like warm up or get in there and you're hearing two of yourself. Yeah. This is, this is a, a, one of those areas that it can get a little bit fuzzy and a little bit weird as a performer of like not knowing, am I in key or was I out of key on the last take? What's going on here? Like, um, and that, you know, this is, there's not really, there's no perfect solution for this sort of stuff, but do you have some workarounds that you've used in the past, Drew? Well, you know, the, the thing, the thing, what you just mentioned is, I mean, really what you've mentioned is that is reiterates the idea that Luna has solved these problems. And, in, but, but having said that, some people actually like that. Some people prefer, mm -hmm. you know, being able to hear the pre-roll audio, the live audio ahead of time. And of course, that's what console tracking mode is all about. Console tracking mode. If you like this system, if you like being able to keep things very separate um, as far as on, on the monitoring path and keeping those live paths open, then console tracking mode is great uh, with Luna that will, you know, maintain uh, yeah, those true. workflows, you know, that you like. Uh, the other thing is the, the feature we just added was option K, right? Mm -hmm. Taking record, record enabled tracks and throwing them into input mode is a way of getting it's like half of these it's like halfway between both of these workflows where you can still be in luna you can still have everything centralized but if that artist needs to hear themselves on line number three to get their pitch and get their tone before you punch on line number four then option k drops you into input mode lets them hear themselves ahead of time and then you punch on line number four um you know as far as the other as far as getting around like honestly like making luna was to get around it like, <laughs> like when I, you know when you're tracking drums with an apollo and pro tools like there was really it was very difficult. There's really no way to keep it from being able to hear both at the same time, which um, I got used to it and clients don't seem to mind it. But, um, you know, I know it's, I, I just prefer the way it is in Luna. It's just seemed, it's so much tighter and more focused integrated mm -hmm. workflow. Well, and I mean, the, and the other side of the coin for this too is, uh, and the, the way I lazily did this a lot was, uh, I, I would put up with the buffer size sometimes. Like oh would, yeah, yeah, forgot I, about I, that. I would, yeah. leave, I would leave console muted. Like I would, I would do input, you know, signal processing <clears throat> unison, uh, and then you know, come into Pro Tools. I would leave it off a of low latency monitor mode, and I would just put up with a little bit of latency. Which yeah, often it's it's not ideal, but it can a lot of times, especially if you're in a session that doesn't have a lot of plugins, a lot of processing, at a 64 buffer size. You're in the ballpark, like you know, yeah, you're, with you're, some reverb, at, you're, you know, you're like yeah. what ten yeah, milliseconds, feasible. maybe twenty milliseconds, like total round trip. Um, which you, you might know some when you're doing vocals or something very, very rhythmic, but 
uh one a fascinating thing i learned man is like p- uh, a keyboard like when you're playing a piano a real physical piano there can be up to 50 milliseconds of latency between your key press and when the sound comes back to you like oh, the wow, really milliseconds add up really really fast like the distance from a stage monitor to your ear i think it's like eight milliseconds 10 milliseconds like the speed of yeah. sound is slower than we sometimes think That's a, yeah it's about a millisecond per foot yeah mm-hmm. or roughly yeah. yeah um so you know so we've shown you guys all these tricks and, and this is really in the pursuit of a fantastic low latency experience but i just wanted to add this little thing on the end of like there's also you know some of us are, are willing to put up with some latency sometimes to be able to just mon- you know input monitor and do this all in pro tools for me, again, this is a reason why I loved moving into Luna to do stuff is like all of a sudden now I'm getting the functionality that I really liked being able to just record an input monitor and not think about it too hard. But with the perfect low latency experience that I get out of console, I'm getting now the best of both worlds put together. Um, yeah. But it's really interesting, like Matt, you had uh, Ableton Live up earlier. Like I've seen uh, a few people put out videos where they, they talk about the workarounds that they do to get low latency or to get monitoring through plugins, but then also be able to record a, a perfectly synced take where you actually have to use like yeah. two tracks, right? Where one's recording and the other is monitoring. Uh, and, you know, the record one, if you do it wrong, will actually be out of sync from from your track. Yeah, exactly. And, th- yeah, there's definitely other ways to do it in other DAWs, but even the best case scenario in those other DAWs is still way more latent than, than just using Luna. So, mm-hmm. yeah, Luna really makes it the, the clear choice for this kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, guys, I think that was basically everything that we had in our outline here to talk about around cues. So uh, if you guys have got any questions in the chat, this is this is your chance uh, to hit us up and, and we'll, we'll discuss about it here. But otherwise, this is going to turn into a nice little uh, reference resource for you guys to check out in the future as you're, tra- as you're doing different uh, tracking scenarios and different cue setups. Uh, this is a great one. And there's... Uh, also want to give a big shout out. Uh, there's another, we did a deep dive last year. Uh, Drew uh, walked us through all about arm mode, right? Like yeah. we did, we did ju- an equally long show talking just about arm mode. We touched on a lot of these different topics as well. Um, but definitely be sure to check that one out. If you, if you're looking for even more information and, and more ideas around uh, accelerated real time monitoring and what that means in terms of cues and instruments and effects and everything. Uh, just, I'll throw that in the chat right now. Awesome. Yeah, it's we'll, yeah. a great resource. Um, yeah, Daniel, I can't imagine using another system than Luna console now. It feels like you've had it forever. Joel's like, I don't remiss, I don't miss recording in Studio One after being in Luna for so long now. Like, this is, we're, we're not alone, guys. There, there's there's a lot of folks out here that are in that same uh, same boat. Yep. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, Damon's asking, when I went to console for now because I want to loop record and live stream, how do I adjust the monitor mix with one fader in, inside a console? Yeah, Is there's there... no way to do it with one fader, but I think um, the best it's way to do it would be drag. hold down option and drag one yeah. of the faders, and that'll drag down all the channel faders by the same amount at once. And that's and that's which one is, of the key, that's one of the, the key commands. <laughs> I was like, that's one of the yeah. key commands that isn't consistent between the two. You found you found it the is, yeah. you found the one, uh, Damon. So option, option clicking on a fader and console moves them all together. Yep. And in Luna, command it's on the, the fader reverse, yeah. does it all. There we go. Yeah, uh, and that's a. I mean, on that topic, that's a good point. The uh, the monitor knob in the bottom right corner of Luna or console or on your physical Apollo that just controls the volume that's actually coming out of those outputs. It doesn't actually control the level of that mix if you're sending that mix to somewhere uh, digitally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like for our streaming setup, where monitor left and right is the input to the streaming software, the the monitor knob doesn't control that volume. It's just actually the fader levels that do. Yeah, it's important. Very important point. Same with the headphone. The headphone, the final volume of your headphones are dictated by the the volume knob on the right above the headphone jack. Right. Um, and Daniel is recommending you could potentially use an aux for that sort of stuff, right, Matt? Like you could send, say, you know, as a cue mix, you could use an aux, send all the tracks that you want to go to cue number one to aux one, and then use aux one to now feed your cue one, and that would give you a single fader control over it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The auxes have a tiny bit of latency, but nothing that would mess you up for that kind of setup. So, yeah, that would totally work. Nice. Uh, Danielle's saying she's watched the ARM episode four or five times now. 
<laughs> but it, it's a good one. <laughs> it's a good. It's it's one. It's one of the best ones. That's for sure. Uh, two forty. I think that was two forty, right? Mm-hmm. Two hours and forty minutes. Yeah, dude, oh we, we 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 got through this one really efficiently today. We were, we were thinking it was going to be super long, but uh, I think we rocked it here. Um, yeah. Sebastian nice. Sebastian's asking, what's the main reason they ditch Logic and stick to Luna? Anything that Logic can do that Luna can't? Yeah, dude, there's there's still plenty of stuff like Luna. Luna's still a baby. Uh, it's you know, we're just about to have our one year birthday, um, but it's real. The, you know, we've talked about this a bunch in today's show. Like Luna's real focus. Real time tracking behaviors, incredible sonics for mixing, really powerful, inspiring instruments. Uh, but you know, there's a lot. Logic is a much more mature DAW. It's been, was it like 20, 30 years? Like a lot, 30. All yeah. the way back Into from the like 80s, e Magic days. All the way back. Yeah, uh-huh. exactly. Magic, yeah. So. Um, Notator. It used to be called Notator. Mm-hmm. So there, the there's a lot version. of there's a lot of features that you'll find in Logic that you won't find in other DAWs. And, uh, you know, even Pro Tools has, there's features between the two that, uh, they can't do so. You know, ultimately, end of the day, it's about picking the right tool for what you want to do and what your clients want to do. Um, and you know, if it's uh, a lot of us juggle between multiple DAWs for different things, right? So, like when uh, when people send videos to be mixed, uh, you know, if the, it's like a post scenario, I'm going to go back to Pro Tools and and mix a video in there, so I can have video monitoring and some of the other post tools that I need that Luna doesn't have. Uh, so you know, these days, man. Uh, <laughs> said before man you got to be you got to be doll fluid you got to be able to kind of move between them and and know like you know ableton live is incredible for for sequencing and programming and and coming up with tracks and then some people are producing in logic and mixing in luna or recording in pro tools and editing and logic like you know it's all over the map but you got to choose the right tool for the right job uh and know that luna does have some really distinct advantages especially when it comes to tracking and low latency stuff uh, as well as on the mixing side, being able to have some incredible sonic power built into the mixer. Yeah, it's really the only yeah. DAW, like for me, it's just Luna is the mindset, you know, and we, we've seen Connor on here a bunch of times and Lev and stuff. Like the mindset is, let's we're doing this differently it's all about the sonics it's Mm -hmm. you know i I, it used to be i've told this story before but like it used to be that the studio you went to it was all about the gear and the people and what console did it have and and so forth and like it's we're bringing that back with luna other dolls are just function it's pure function 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 and not really worried about the sonics they leave the sonics to you which is great but I think what we what we've lost sight of is that is that whoa the tape machine you used what brand of tape you put up on that tape machine the console that it flowed through like all of that used to be a defining and determining factor of how your record got made and with with most DAWs that's out the window Luna is bringing that back it's bringing this old school mentality of like you know wow when it comes off tape when you hear it back it sounds different than when you laid it down and that's mm-hmm. like a that's a unique thing that's out there that nobody's really doing in a comprehensive, meaningful way. And uh, you know, we're just getting started with Luna. Wait, you know, I I can't wait for people to see what's coming down the pike. It's gonna be it's <laughs> gonna be amazing. It's gonna be amazing. I mean, some, you guys you guys are aware of a few <laughs> of the things we we did a we did a nice little preview show at the beginning of the year, uh, showing off some of the future features that are coming to Luna this year. Uh, you know, the utility reel, for instance, we already uh, just delivered. Uh, these guys saw the control surface support. They're working. The team is working on that. Uh, so, with those in mind, know that we also we we kept a lot of surprises that are that are arriving this year that are going to be uh, some game changing features. I think that people are going to really really enjoy. Uh, I, w- I wish I could tell you guys right now, but we got we got to save something. We got to save something <laughs> we'll save for something. the launch. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so guys, this is this has been super fun. Uh, really great walking you guys through, and, and great to think about all these different tracking scenarios. Uh, and as always, it's, you guys have such great questions uh, all along the way. Um, unless there's any other questions, I think we can kind of wrap it up here. Of uh, Be sure uh tune back in tomorrow. We're going to be launching a new Luna session with Fab, Lewis, Cato, and Will Knox. Uh, that's going to be a, a really, really fun session to walk through again. Uh, the song just turned out so good. And now that you guys are going to be able to download it and, and play around with those tracks yourselves, you're going to discover even more awesomeness about that song. Uh, so tune in tomorrow for that. Don't miss out on the, the kick-ass sale that's going on over on, uh, plugins, both for UAD and also for Luna. There's the, the satellite, uh, satellite promotion that's still going on, I believe, uh, where you can get yep. by, uh, by any satellite. I think I saw Prince Jordan was mentioning he picked up one to, to get the free plugins already. Um, uh, yeah. so don't, don't miss out on that because there's some amazing plugins that get included with the new satellite. And... I think that's all. If you guys have got suggestions for shows, 
hit us up either in the chat or you can always also email us live at uaudio.com. Send us in your music that you're working on. We'd love to feature it in the opening countdowns. Tag us on your photos. Like this video. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the notification bell so that way your phone buzzes anytime that we go live or release a new video. And I think that's it. I Matt, do. Drew, you guys, so. absolutely, you guys, we crushed it today. Great, great work on on walking people through all this stuff. Uh, so thank you as always for for your guys' diligent work and uh, preparing and getting things ready for these shows and uh, and coming on and sharing all the info and knowledge. Well, thanks for hosting us. You absolutely. do a great job. Uh, and thank you yeah, guys. Happy to it, do it. Thank you everybody at home for watching. Uh, really fun hanging out with you guys again, and we'll be back here again next Monday. So have a great week, guys. Go make some music. Peace. See you guys soon. Hey, everybody.